Okay, so here we have chapter nine, section 9.1, applications involving right triangles. So to solve a right triangle, it means to find the lengths of all three sides of the triangle and the measure of two acute angles. Since we already know one of the angles is 90 degrees, since by definition, that's what makes it a right triangle, right? This can be done by using the Pythagorean theorem, which is a squared plus b squared equals c squared. In addition, remembering that since the sum of the angles of a triangle is 180 degrees, then in a right triangle, the remaining two sides must add to equal 90 degrees. And before I continue with the example, which I'd already worked out one of them, and then I had to re-record because I was making some silly errors, um, but I wanted to talk about the naming convention for triangles. Throughout this whole chapter, you're going to have to label your own triangles or you're going to have to um, take a triangle that's been given and label it so that you can find sides that make sense to you, okay? So the naming convention is, is you can name the vertices anything you want, okay? So I can call this angle a or B or C, it doesn't matter what you call it, okay? I can call this one A, B, or C, just not the same as that one. And then once you've already used those two labels, you can call your third angle whatever variable you haven't chosen yet, okay? So I could say A, B, C, I can say A, B, C, I can say A, B, C. It doesn't matter how you order the vertices, how you order them, just as long as you label each one a different label, okay? but you need to use a capital letter to label the angles, okay? Once you have the capital letters for your angles, then you're going to use lowercase letters to identify the sides across from that angle. So notice that across the angle capital B is the side lowercase b. Across from the angle capital A is lowercase a. And then across from the capital C is the lowercase c side. Now, in a right triangle, we already know that this one here, whatever you labeled it, is a right angle, okay? Now, in the examples that they've given us, they've labeled it for us, so that's nice. But I'm telling you ahead of time the naming convention, because as we move further into the chapter, they're not going to give you even the triangle at all. They're just gonna tell you a triangle with this certain information, and then you're gonna have to label it um, according to the information that they gave you, and you're gonna have to label the missing information as well according to this naming convention in order to be able to identify the correct answers in the correct places in my math labs, okay? So they're gonna say, what is, lowercase c equal to, and unless you named your um, triangle correctly, you're not even going to know where lowercase c is, okay? So you have to make sure that you're labeling using that name label convention. A capital letters for the angles, and then lowercase letters across from those capital letters should match, just they should be lowercase. Okay, so for example one, it says you Use the right triangle below to solve the triangle. Round the lengths of two decimal places to two decimal places and round the angle measure to one decimal place. So the first thing I did was, is I already know this one's 90 degrees and the whole thing has to add up to equal 100, 180, which means I'm already gonna take out 90 so that only leaves that these two sides have to add up to equal 90 degrees. And I've been given one of those angles as 35 degrees. So that means that 35 degrees plus this angle B should equal the 90 degrees. And so if I set that equation, I wrote out the equation, and if I solve for B, I would have to minus 35 on both sides, and then I get that B is equal to 55 degrees. So I went ahead in here and I labeled B as 55 degrees. Now what I need to do is I need to find the length of side C, and I need to find the length of side A. Now you cannot use the Pythagorean theorem here because the Pythagorean theorem, you would have to know at least two of those quantities so that you could solve the equation to figure out what the third one is. But I don't know two of the quantities. I only know one side and that's it. 
So to find C, you do have to use the side C so that you could solve for it, right? And then you also have to use the side that was given to you. It makes no sense to use this one because both of them are unknown. And when you're trying to know an unknown, right? You're trying to find an unknown. It should be the only unknown variable in your equation. And that's how you're able to find out what it is equivalent to. So I don't want to take side C and side A because that will not lead me anywhere productive. What I want to use is side C and the one side that I was given. And so if you know that you can, there's two ways to do this answer. I drew my focus in on this angle. And I said, what are these two sides with respect to this angle? Well, those two sides are the opposite of angle B and the hypotenuse. And we have a relationship opposite over hypotenuse that's actually the trig function sine. So then I know that the sine of 55 degrees is going to be 8 over C, which is what I have here. And then I multiplied both sides of my equation by my common denominator. So it canceled here, but I ended up with C times sine of 55 degrees equal to 8. And then I divided both sides by sine of 55 degrees. So I ended up with the equation C equals 8 over sine of 55 degrees. 8 over sine of 55 degrees. And I am in degree mode, so I'm just going to hit enter. And I get this, but they said round it to two decimal places. So the second 6 is going to make the first 6 turn to a 7, which is how I got this answer. But that's because I focused in on angle B. And I decided to see how this side and this side corresponded to angle B. I could have also chosen to use angle A. And I know this is lowercase a, so this is capital A. Um, I also could have chosen to use this angle as my focus. But had I had done that, this side is actually adjacent to 35 degrees, and this side is still the hypotenuse. So I know the relationship adjacent over hypotenuse is the cosine of the angle. And since my focus was on this angle, it's cosine of 35 degrees. And adjacent is the 8, and the hypotenuse is C. So if I multiply by C on both sides, and then I divide by cosine of 35 degrees on both sides, I'm going to end up with this equation here. And if I type that in the calculator, I get the exact same value, okay? So it really wouldn't matter which angle you are focused on as long as you use the correct labeling here and the correct trig function when you come to write that ratio, okay? So again, I used angle B as my focus over here to figure out what A is. So for A, it's the same situation. I want to use the unknown A so that I could find it. But then I also want to use the number that was given. You try, I mean, sometimes it's unavoidable, but you would try to stay away from the values that you found when trying to set it up. If it's possible to just use values that were given, that's your best bet. Um, the reason why is because if you happen to have made an error when you were finding one value, it's going to throw off the other value as well. Okay? So that's why you always want to try to use the information you're given to find the unknowns. Um, but there are going to be some cases in the future where we don't have a choice. We're going to have to take a number that we found in order to find another value. Okay. So for here, I can though. I can. There is a measurement that relates these two sides with respect to 55 degrees. This is adjacent and this is the opposite. And we know that opposite over adjacent is the tangent. So the tangent of 55 degrees is 8 over A. And then if I multiply both sides by A, I'll have A tangent of 55 equal to 8. And then if I divide both sides by tangent of 55 degrees, I get A equals 8 over tangent of 55 degrees. And if I type that in the calculator, we get um, that 1 is not going to affect the 0. So it's just 5.60. Now remember, that's because my focus was around angle B. What happens if I decide to choose to focus around angle A again? And you don't have to use the same angle of focus in these two parts. 
You could have used um, angle B for the top to find C and then used angle A to find A. There's no structure there. You don't have to do it one way or the other because they're both going to get you to the same answer. Okay. So what I did here is I said, well, let's look at this one. I noticed that these two sides that I need to take that are circled are the opposite and the adjacent. And so we already know that opposite over adjacent is tangent, right? So tangent of 35 degrees would be A over 8. And if I multiply both sides by 8, I get that A equals 8 times tangent of 35 degrees. And so if I type that in here, 8 tangent of 35 degrees, you get the exact same value again, right? So it doesn't matter which angle you use as your focus. What's going to matter is that you choose the correct trig function and you're using the correct ratio here for the sides, okay? Now it tells us you're always going to have to uh, verify whether your measures are reasonable or not. Like, do they make sense for the question, okay? Because there are going to be situations where you're going to do the math and then it turns out that um, you may get two different answers. If I do it, if I did it this way versus the way I did it over here, I do it these ways, I just may get two different answers. And there's a way to confirm over which one of those is the actual answer. Okay. And so the way we know is that angles and lengths of opposite sides are proportionate. So the smallest angle, uh, the side opposite of that should be the shortest side. And the largest angle opposite of that should be the largest length of the side, okay? So you have to make sure of that. And does that information fit? Well, I know that this is eight, A is apparently 5.6, and C is apparently 9.7. And so the largest angle does have the largest side, the smallest angle does have the smallest side, and then the angle in between has a value in between these two. So it does um, match up as far as being a reasonable um, answer, okay? So now let's go ahead and move on to um, example two. So it says, use the right triangle below to solve the triangle. Round the length of the side to two decimal places and the angle measures to one decimal place. So last time they gave me two angles and one side. This time they're giving me two sides and only one angle, okay? So I actually can start with the Pythagorean theorem to figure out what the length of this side is. So we know that C squared equals A squared plus B squared. So C equals the square root. The shortest side, this is A, A, so this is little a. That's B, so this is little b, okay? And then this you could think of as capital C, but it's a right angle, 90 degrees. Um, so I get A, which is four squared plus B, which is seven squared. So we get the square root of 16 plus 49 is 65. And then if I round that to two decimal places, we get 8.06. So we know that side C is about 8.06. Okay, so then that's one side, but now I need to find the measurements, okay? So I want to, either one of these, it doesn't matter which one, either one of them, okay? And you only need to find one because once you have one of them, you just subtract it from 90 and you'll be able to find the other one, right? So again, I have a choice here. I can focus on angle A or I can focus on angle B. It does not matter. And if you want me to do both of them, that's totally fine. We'll just say alternate solution for angles. So I'm going to do it one way here, and then I'll do it another way down here. So I'm going to focus on angle A. 
And again, remember, you want to use the sides you were given, not the one you found, if possible. So for angle A, I want to use the opposite and the adjacent. So I know the opposite over adjacent is the tangent. So then that means the tangent <coughs> of A should equal 4 over 7 which means that A should equal 10 inverse of four over seven. So let's see what we get there. 10 inverse, oops, 10 inverse of four over seven. And we get um, round to one decimal place, we get 29.7 degrees. So then, 29.7 degrees plus B should equal 90 degrees because that 90 plus this 90 will make the whole 180, which means that B equals 60.3 degrees. Okay, so does that make sense? Let's go see. Let's put 29.7 degrees and 60.3 degrees. So this is the smallest angle between 29, 60, and 90. So, and it has the smallest length. This is the largest angle and it has the largest length. So the measurements do make sense, okay? Um, but I wanna try to do it focusing on a different angle. So instead of focusing on tangent, I wanna, I mean on angle A, I want to focus on angle B and see if I get the same measurements, okay? So remember, we've got to use the two sides that were given and not the one that we found. So I can use this one and this one. Now this is the opposite and this is adjacent. So I know that opposite over adjacent is going to be the tangent, which means the tangent of B equals opposite is seven, and adjacent is four, which means B equals 10 inverse of seven over four. So let's see, 10 inverse of seven over four is 60, and this will round it up to 60.3. And that's matching what we had got the other way. And then we know that a plus 60.3 degrees should equal 90 degrees, which means that A should equal 29.7 degrees. So again, the same measurements. So there's a lot of choice going on in these problems. You can choose to do it one way, or you can choose to do it another way, but whichever way you choose, as long as you're doing it correctly, you will come up with the same answers for both um, methods, okay? And if you don't come up with the same answers, then you're going to have to verify which one makes sense. Because if I did it this way and I got certain angles and then I did it this way and I got different angles, I need to make sure that the smallest angle has the smallest side and the longest or the largest angle has the longest side. And if one of these is not that situation, then that's not the one I'm going to take as my solution. I'm only gonna use the solution where everything matches um even meets the reasonable solution criteria okay so of course we've got to get into um these word problems right so it says a surveyor can measure the width of a river by setting up a transit point a transit at a point c on one side of the river and making a siding from a point A on the other side. So here's um, the transit and he's making a siding over here. Um, he's like viewing that point over there. So he's got this here. He knows what this distance is because it's gonna tell me in a minute. And he knows what that angle is. And so he's looking at this point over here. So it says refer to the figure below, which I just did. After turning through an angle of 90 degrees at C, so this is capital C, um, the surveyor walks a distance of 300 meters. So this direction is 300 meters. 
to point B. Using the transit at point B, the angle beta, so this is beta. I don't know why they said beta here and then they used theta there. Doesn't make any sense. Um, and actually they could have just used, um, they could have just used little capital B. It looks like they're, they're labeling the vertices and then they're labeling the angles like alpha, beta, and gamma. It's okay, it's all the same. Alpha is like A, beta is like B, and gamma is like C. This is alpha, or my best alpha, beta, and then gamma. Okay, so that's 25 degrees. So this is 25 degrees. What is the width of the river rounded to the nearest meter? So what they're asking me for is this. They wanna know what that value is. And so how can I use um, this side that I need to find and the side that I was given with respect to the only other angle I know, which is angle B or angle beta, okay? I do know that this is opposite and this is adjacent. So I could say opposite over adjacent is equal to tangent of that beta. So then that gives me the equation tangent of 25 degrees equals opposite over adjacent. And if I multiply by 300 on both sides to solve for B, I get that B equals 300 times tangent of 25 degrees. So 300 times tangent of 25 degrees is 139.8922, so on and so forth. And it says round to the nearest meter. So this eight is going to affect that. So it's 140 meters. Okay, so in another kind of example, it's very much like this one. This measurement, it has a name. It's actually called the angle of elevation because this is your eye line, right? Your line of sight. And then there's an, you're gonna direct your eyes in another direction. And instead of looking straight forward, you're now looking up here. So instead of looking straight forward, it's now going up there. And so that's called an angle of elevation. So they have a picture of it here. So you've got the object, this is, where your le eye level should be. But if you gear your eyes and you look up, now this is your line of sight. And that's called, because of your, your straight line of, straight forward line of sight is this direction. It looks like it went upward because you're looking up, right? Similarly, you can look down, right, with your eyes. So here's your straight line of vision. And then if you're looking downward, that's called an angle of depression, okay? So it's angle of elevation if you're looking up and angle of depression if you're looking down, okay? And so it says a classical trigonometry problem involves determining the height of a tree without taking the measuring tape or what? Without taking a tape measure up the tree to the top. A surveyor does the following, measures the distance from the base of the tree to a location away from the tree and measures the angle of elevation from this location to the top of the tree. The angle of elevation and angle of depression are as follows, and I already discussed. You look up for elevation, you look down for de depression. So A, given the horizontal distance from the tree, that horizontal distance means um, like around the ground, so I like to draw this, and when I draw this, um, here's my tree. I'm talking about from the center down, that's gonna be your height, right? And then you're going out over here. So it says the horizontal distance from the tree is 48 feet. So you're talking about this, and you don't even need to be in the center of the tree. That was wrong in doing that. but the height is gonna be here, right? 
So you can have that as another vertice. So from the tree, I'm going to have a horizontal distance of 48 feet. And I know that the angle of elevation to the top of the tree is 65 degrees. So which one is that? Because they use the word elevation. So is that this angle or is that this angle? Think if your, if your head was this little dot, okay? If you're here, to get to the other point, you're gonna have to look up. If your head is here, in order to look at this point, you'd have to look down. Now remember, if your eyes are going up, it's elevation, and if your eyes are going down, it's depression. Since they told me elevation, my eyes should be going up, which means it is not this angle, because this angle I'm looking down. So it has to be this angle is the 65 degrees. And it says, what is the height of the tree? So it's this height that they're asking me to find, okay? And so if I use this as my center, um, as I'm trying to decipher which trigonometric function to use, I can use opposite over adjacent. And so opposite over adjacent, is going to be the tangent of that angle. So in this case, tangent of 65 degrees equals the opposite, which is eight, over the adjacent, which is 48. And if I multiply both sides by 48, I get that the height will be 48 times tangent of 65 degrees. And so what is 48 tangent of 65 degrees? it's 102.9, so we usually say it's about 103 feet. Now, because we know this is a right angle, right, we could have said, oh, well, 90 plus 35 degrees equals, um, 90 degrees. So I know that that angle is 35 degrees. And then I could have taken opposite over hypotenuse, but I would have had 48 over H, okay? And so I could have said that 10 of 35 degrees equals opposite, which is 48 over H, which would mean that H equals 48 over tangent of 35 degrees. And if I do that, Notice I get a different value. Um, that would be about 69 feet, right? And so then you have to be careful because which one of these is supposed to be the correct answer? Oh, I did make a mistake when I said that this was 35 degrees because 65 plus 35 is more than 90, right? So this would have had to have been 25 degrees, which means this would have been 25 degrees and this would have been 25 degrees. So 48 over tangent of 25 degrees is actually equal to the same thing, which is the 103 feet. I was wondering, because I thought that it should be coming out to the same exact value, okay? So regardless of whether you're using this angle that they gave you, or you did the quick subtraction from 90 and you figured out this one and you worked with that one, you still should get the same response, okay? Now for part B, it says, make the problem more realistic by saying the surveyor's instrument is five feet above the ground, right? Like your eye level. So it's not like something that's on the floor like this that's making the view. It's more of like you have an actual person over there where that tree is at. So here's the person, and I know this is not to scale, okay? So you've got the person here and they're the ones that are looking at the height of the tree and the, the person is a distance away, okay? And so then um, we still know that the elevation is 65 degrees and I still know that the person is 48 feet away. But 
if they are five feet, if the instrument is five feet above the ground, when I do my work to figure out this height, I figure out the height is 103 feet. But guess what? That's not the height of the whole tree because I still have to talk about what's happening from the eye level to the ground, right? And we know that that is five feet. So the actual answer here would be 103 plus five, which means 108 feet. So you have to take that instrument, the height of that instrument into consideration because it will affect the overall height, okay? Now it says, suppose you also want to know the distance from the survey point to the top of the tree. So let's say you want to know this measurement, okay? And it doesn't matter which one you're looking at. Um, let's say you want, because they both have the same, the same measurements in both of these triangles. Um, from the survey point to the top of the tree, what are two ways you can determine this distance, okay? One way I suggest you use is only the information that you were given. So only the angles and the side you were given to figure out this one. So if I use the angle that I was given, which was 65 degrees, this is the adjacent and this is the hypotenuse. And I know that adjacent over hypotenuse is actually the cosine of an angle. So cosine of that 65 degrees is adjacent over the hypotenuse. And since um, they didn't label it here, but we can just say hypotenuse or we can label it whatever we want. I'll just label it x, right? If this is x. Um, if I solve this equation for x, I get that x equals 48 over cosine of 65 degrees. And so I get 48 over cosine of 65 degrees, which tells me that it's about 114 feet. Okay. Another way I could have done it, and it's okay to do it as long as your work in your previous steps is 100% correct, okay? Because if this is the wrong answer and I use that value, I'm going to get another wrong answer, right? But you could, knowing that this side is 48 feet and that side is about 103 feet, you could just use the Pythagorean theorem to figure out this measurement. So I could say that um, 48 squared plus 103 squared should equal x squared. Or that x should equal the square root of whatever that is. One, two, nine, one, three, which is about the same, one, one, four. Okay, so there are two ways to find that other value. The choice is yours. I prefer to use um, information that was given, if at all possible, just so that at least I can get one part right, even if I messed up on another part, okay? But sometimes it is inevitable, and sometimes you just have to trust yourself that you did it correctly and use what you found to keep going, okay? So here we have example five. It says the angle of elevation um, and angle of depression. And it just depends on the problem. It says from the edge of a 1,000 foot cliff, the angles of depression to two cars in the valley below are 10 degrees and 15 degrees. How far apart are the cars? Okay. So I'm gonna draw my cliff. That's the best cliff I can draw. And I know that the measurement from here to here is 1,000 feet because it says it's a 1,000 foot cliff, okay? Now I also know that over here, this is a car, call it car one. And then a little bit further is another car car two, and this is the ground, okay? They haven't given me any information about the heights of these cars, so you're just gonna assume they don't have one, to be honest. 
it's a really weird thing, but they just did not give me enough information in that regard. Okay, so then I've got this and this happening. And this, if I just draw a straight edge, even though the clip is not actually straight, that's my right angle, okay? So if you notice, I have two um, angles. Now it's talking about the angle of depression, which means I need to be looking downward. So they're talking about this angle right here. Because if my eyes are up there, I need to be looking downward. I'm trying to draw straight lines to that as best as I can. Okay. So the angle of depressions are here. There's this angle and then there's this angle. Now they give me two measurements and you really have to use your logic as to which one is which. Okay. So notice that this is a smaller angle and this is a bigger angle. So then the bigger one has to be the 15 degrees and then the smaller one has to be the 10 degrees. Okay. I probably drew my cars too far out, which is why this angle looks like a lot bigger than 10 degrees. Um, but I didn't want to make the image too small. Okay. So they're never to scale, right? I don't know what the answers are going to be. So it's impossible to draw it to scale, but you just kind of get a good sketch and label it correctly. And you should still be able to come up with the correct answers. Now, what it's asking me is what, how far apart are these two cars? Okay. And so what I can do is I can figure out, use the smaller triangle, this triangle that's on the inside. I can use that to figure out this distance, call it distance one, because it's to car one. Then I can take the giant right triangle and find this whole distance. So this whole distance, I'm gonna call D2 because that's the distance to D2. And then if I wanna know the measurement just from here to here, I would have to take the big one, D2, and subtract the little one, D1. Okay, so I'm calling this D. That's the distance there. And so, in order for me to figure this out, I'm going to have to find both of those sides. So remember, for the shaded one that I have here, to find D1, we need to use the angle we were given and these two sides. So this is the opposite and this is the, the adjacent. So we know that opposite over adjacent is equal to tangent, and I'm using the I'm using actually this little shaded one. So what is the measurement here of that shaded part? I know the whole thing is 15, but just this part should only be five degrees because this part is already 10. So it can only go five more degrees. So it actually should be tangent of five degrees is equal to opposite which is d1 over adjacent which is a thousand and so then we get um let's see we get that d1 if i multiply both sides by 100 those will cancel and i get d1 equals 100 tangent of five degrees which is 100 tangent of five is 8.7 feet. We'll just round it right there. So it really shouldn't be this far out. It should be a lot closer, right? Which is why that angle should be a lot, it should visually look a lot smaller than the 10 degree angle. Okay, so now we need to take the big triangle. So I need to talk about, I like to use color to, fig, to describe what's going on. But now we need to take this giant, right triangle okay so we're looking at the whole giant triangle and when i do that the measurement here is the whole 15 degrees right so um <clears throat> when i'm doing this this uh problem here I am realizing that my image is not right. 
So I'm going to have to erase absolutely the entire problem. And we're going to have to start all over again. Because I said that it was an angle of depression, but my problem doesn't draw, my triangle that I drew doesn't draw an angle of depression. And you probably caught that watching this, so I apologize if you've just been listening to all the wrong things I've been saying. Um, but I am realizing now that this is not the picture that I should have here. So let me see. Let me try to erase as much of the pen as I can so I can keep erasing the pencil. Okay, so we do have our cliff. I mean, there was nothing wrong with that. That was okay. That's a thousand feet. We know that. But what I should have had is an angle of depression. So we do know that we have this side and we have this side, right? And this is car one and this is car two. But I'm supposed to be comparing everything to the regular line of sight, okay? And so essentially what ends up happening is you get two triangles like this, okay? So this is gonna get really weird. So if I wanna find the distance between these two, I'm going to need to find, um, let's visually look at this. So I have this triangle here. Hmm. So what's happening, this is my angle of depression and all of that. This angle is the 10 degrees. And then this angle is the 15 degrees, which makes this one by itself five degrees, okay? But the whole thing is 15 degrees. Now, this image is not a triangle, right? So I have to decipher, and then this is still the ground. And that's still 90 degrees. Okay, so I have to figure out this triangle and then this triangle still. Okay, so a little bit harder than it would it look like. Now I know that this is 90 degrees. And then I also know that this measurement should be 90 degrees. But if this whole thing is already 15 degrees, right? What is 90 minus 15 degrees? It's 75 degrees which means this angle here is 75 degrees. And if that is 75 degrees, then it's, I know that this one is 15 degrees, okay? And so that's for this triangle here. And so I'm gonna use this pink triangle here to find that distance one that we were talking about, okay? So when I do that, I'm going to use the opposite and the adjacent. So I'm still doing opposite over adjacent, which is still the tangent. But since I'm using this angle to do opposite and adjacent, it should be 15 degrees. And the opposite is 1,000. And the adjacent is D1. So that gives me the equation D1 equals um, 100 over tangent of 15 degrees. And what does that look like? 100 over the tangent of 15 degrees is 323. We won't use the decimal. Or 373, I'm sorry. So we know that one is 373 feet. So that's D1, okay? So minus 373. But I still need to figure out what the D2 is, okay? And so D2 is going to be this triangle. It's going to be the big one that looks like that, which is what I had earlier. But it's the whole triangle, okay? And so now we know that this is 75 degrees and we know the difference between 10 and 15 is five degrees which makes this whole angle 85, 80 degrees. 75 plus five is 80 degrees, okay? Which, if I'm looking at this triangle, 
If this is 90 and this is 80, it means that this one has to be 10 degrees. And I'm gonna use the same thing. I'm gonna use the opposite and this adjacent side, which is D2, the whole thing, okay? So I'm gonna say opposite over adjacent again is tangent of 10 degrees which is going to be, oh, it should have been a thousand over that number, not a hundred, oops. A thousand over D2, which tells me D2 should be a thousand over tangent of 10 degrees. So it's probably gonna be a lot bigger number here. So let's redo the other one, because it should be a thousand. So a thousand divided by tangent of 15 degrees is three, seven, three, two feet. That's starting to make more sense, especially with the cliff. There should be lots of feet going on here. And then a thousand degree or thousand feet divided by tangent of 10 degrees. And I get five, six, seven, one. So in order to find the little distance between the two, right in order to find this distance here we have to take the big one minus the littler one and we'll be able to find that distance so we have to take five six seven one minus three seven three two and we get one nine three nine feet and that is the actual answer. So we had a lot of geometry basically going on here with all of those different angles. But we had to follow the rule about depression. And depression means your regular eyesight and then you go downward. And what I had before, I was just starting from here and going downward, but that's not what depression means. Depression means from the line of regular sight, horizontal sight, straightforward sight, downward okay so i originally had my triangle my triangle was fine i just needed to consider something extra which was the fact that i was talking about angles of depression okay so to be very careful there um so our last um example has to do with bearings so finding the bearing of an object so it says in navigation and surveying the direction or the bearing from point zero to p one is denoted by the symbolism in 30 degrees east so you start off with north and then you go 30 degrees in the east direction and you land at that p1 indicating that the bearing is 30 degrees east of north in writing the bearing from zero to p regular P or any P, the direction north or south always appears first. So you're always starting up here, down here, and then you're followed by which direction you're going, left or right, and the angle that which you're, you're traveling that, okay? So if you're up here, you're gonna go a certain angle, either east to the right or west to the left. If you're south, you're gonna be going east to the right or west to the left, okay? And so notice the different labels here. So this is north, and then they went 70 degrees toward the west. Here was south, and then they went 50 degrees towards the west. Here they were south, and then they went 20 degrees towards this one. So this one, if I was to label it, should have been south and then 20 degrees um, east. So that one wasn't labeled. Now, in example six, it says, solve an applied problem bearing of an airplane. A Boeing 777 aircraft takes off from O'Hare Airport on a runway to left. Um, so let me draw the north, south, east, and west thing above here. So we've got west over there, north over there, south over there, and east over here. And so what happens is, is the bearing has a north 20 east so that's north and then i'm going to go 20 degrees east 
okay? And it says, after flying for one mile, the pilot um, of the aircraft requests permission to turn 90 degrees and head toward the northwest. So after just a mile, so this is the direction I would have been going, but, oh, sorry. So north, south, east, west, I'm going north, 20 degrees toward the east, and I'm traveling in this direction, right? But I only travel one mile. So from here to here is one mile. And then he requests to go 90 degrees, to turn 90 degrees. So that means from here, I've got to go 90 degrees, which is like an L shape. Okay. And so this is 90 degrees. And then it says, after the plane goes two miles in this direction, so I was in that direction now, which doesn't have a normal bearing because it's not centered at the origin. Um, I went two miles in this direction. So maybe this is two miles. Okay, so I'm here now. And uh, two miles in this direction. What bearing should the control tower use to locate the tower now that it's here? Okay. So this doesn't have a bearing as it is because it's not based on the origin. It's based off of this line over here because I was going in this direction and then I turned and now I'm going in that direction. So what you do is you draw the line from the origin to that point and your job is to figure out the bearing here. Now I do know that I'm north, right? So I know I'm north and I know I'm going in the west direction. I just need to figure out what this angle is. As soon as I can figure out what that angle is, then I can tell you what the bearing is, okay? And so then I, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take um, this whole figure and I'm gonna kinda just put it over here to the side, okay, so that I can make it make sense. So notice that what I have here, this is the image I have. I know that this is two miles, I know that this is one mile, I know that I've got this cut, right? And I know that this is 20 degrees, but I don't know this. This is what I'm trying to figure out, okay? We'll call it X. That's what I'm trying to figure out. And I know that this is a right angle, because I traveled one mile, took a right angle and then traveled the other direction, okay? So I can figure out what this measurement is based on the triangle, okay? And if I use the two sides I was given, I was given the opposite of this big angle over adjacent. So opposite over adjacent is the tangent. And I don't know what this angle is, so I'm just gonna call it theta, okay? And so we know that that's gonna be two over one, or just two, which means that the theta, I'm gonna have to erase it, theta equals 10 inverse of this two. So 10 inverse of two is 63.4 degrees, okay? So then what I'm going to do is I know that that's the whole angle. And I know X plus 20 degrees will equal that whole angle, 63.4 degrees, which means X equals 43.4 degrees, which means that the bearing is going to be north 43.4 degrees west. And that's what they were asking me for there. <clears throat> but notice that I had to draw my image myself, okay? And that gets a little bit complicated. Some problems, most of the problems will have the images drawn for you, which is very nice because it's very helpful. And then there are some problems that they don't have an image and you have to create your own. So you really just have to take each problem as it is and use all of the information that you've learned so far whether it be from geometry, whether it be from trig, whether it be from algebra, you're gonna have to start honing it in all together to make sense of these problems. It's gonna require a lot of critical thinking. Um, and that's gonna be the case throughout the rest of your mathematical journey. 
Um, when you get into um, your physics classes, your calculus classes, um, you're all going to have to, engineering classes, you're all going to have to be putting everything you've learned together and just trying to make sense of everything. But other than that, that is all I have for this section that pretty much covers all the different types of problems you're going to see in the homework. So that is the end of 9.1.